are in day 10. Can you believe it? This is day 10 of our fasting. Before you know it, it will be, deep, be day 20 and then day 30. Um, I don't take for granted your willingness to trust, trust me with what God is doing. And I believe that the Lord is doing something and doing many things in your lives. I believe it. It's not too many people around this country, around this world, who would choose to make a sacrifice in this season. It's easier to make a sacrifice at the beginning of the next season. It's easier. Everything is going in your favor. Everybody is showing up at the gym. Everybody is making their, you know, New Year proposals. But we're concluding the year, the month of December, um, with the desire, the sincere desire to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. This is what we're doing. And this consecration looks different for everyone. But we're given the tools you're hearing the word fasting over and over again. You're looking at people throughout the Bible who are walking in the spirit of God by way of fasting. It's to help to build the muscle for you. It's to help to uh, build your faith and your understanding about this because we don't usually get teaching that is, since, that is singularly focused on fasting. There's so much going on in our Bible that we just don't realize it's there. And there's so much power that we have that is right there at our fingertips. That if we can just learn how to tap into it, if we can just learn how to walk into it, we won't have to ask everyone else to pray for us before we pray for our own selves. We want to ask everyone to shift and change our atmosphere. We can change it our own selves. And we can learn how to declare scripture in a way that we've never learned how to declare it before in our lives. Thank you for being here. There is a weight that I am carrying, um, and I know what you are experiencing. And I don't mean I don't mean to sound super spiritual, um, but there is a weight associated with this fast. And some of you are experiencing a weight. It might be your weight, and it might be a weight of someone near to you. But you're here. And I'm telling you that the tools that God has given you is not just for you to be using for this moment. You're going to use it now, but everything that is being given to you is so that you can go back and reapply and re-strategize in the season that you're about to walk into. There's things that I'm telling you that might not really hit home, but when you try this again three months from now, you're going to find that it flows so well. I'm grateful uh, for Daniel and what we've been given and what we had learned even earlier today. There was a minor mix-up. Your text says Daniel 6, but it meant Daniel 9. Some of you didn't even catch it, and that's fine. Daniel chapter 9 was this morning, and we talked about shouldering the burden. And one thing we walk away from Daniel chapter 9 is this. Elevation for Daniel. Elevation was waiting on Daniel. All he had to do was open his Bible. Sometimes we're looking for something and sometimes we're, we're, we're just, we're, we're, we're overthinking it. We're, we're expecting a circus to happen. But just think about it. Daniel experienced elevation in Daniel chapter 9. He experiences, he had this supernatural experience. The angel of the Lord, the Lord shows up and the Lord gives him the ability to be able to understand the revelation that was coming his way. But all of this happened because he opened his Bible. He opened his Bible just like any other day. And he happened to read something that the Lord gave him the privilege to understand and that was deliverance was on the way. Somebody's going to miss it. Deliverance is on 
the way. Daniel read this morning, Daniel read that deliverance was on the way, breakthrough was on the way. And when he read it in the word of God, it influenced how he prepared his prayers. Someone in here needs to know that your deliverance is on the way. Your breakthrough is on the way. Everything that you, that, that healing is on the way. What you're at, it's on the way. When he saw this in the word of God, he stopped what he was doing and he started praying based on what he read. Everything shifted. His elevation, the elevation that you're looking for, what you're asking God to do in your life is as simple as opening your word. And in opening that word, the Lord gave him understanding. He fashioned his prayer based on what he understood. And then God did everything else. We come to Daniel chapter 10 today, evening. And I want to talk to you from the subject until something breaks. You can say it under your breath. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say until something breaks. Until something breaks. Until something breaks. Daniel chapter 10 verse 1. I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to give you some principles that I need you to hold on to that's going to help you in this journey that I believe is very beneficial. And then we'll conclude our time and then we'll pray. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. This is what you're going to find. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, just for you all who... Uh, probably didn't catch it. It says here the third year of King Cyrus of Persia. You don't hear Babylon anymore. We heard Babylon in chapter 1. We heard Babylon in chapter 2 and 3. We saw Nebuchadnezzar. We saw Darius. But now there's a bigger army, a bigger people that come into town and to overthrow who was the strongest enemy at that, or the strongest army at that time. Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Persia's running the show. And so now there's a new king, a new emperor, a new someone who is running the show. And right now you have Cyrus. And remember, when you read chapter one of Daniel, the very last verse, it says that Daniel remained in the royal court until Cyrus's reign. And so now it's just giving us a sneak preview of the coming attraction. So now it's the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, let's listen to what happens. The Bible says a message was revealed to Daniel. What we don't know is what that revelation, what that message was. But what we do understand is, based on Daniel chapter 9, he is now given supernatural insight. We know in Daniel chapter 2 that he's able to go in and out this spirit realm. I know we don't have this conversation in church often. We don't talk about more realms than just the earthly realm. And I know that's for some of us unfamiliar, but the text teaches us this. Whenever you're able to interpret dreams and visions, and whenever you have this angel or archangel who comes to you, this is, this is more than just earthly things. Everybody with me? And so we do understand that now it's the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. He's now reigning. There's a message revealed to Daniel. God is revealing because now he's walking. He's just walking in the spirit. It's seamless. This is his lifestyle. He's just doing this. They don't even tell us an angel comes. They don't give us any of that information. They just get straight to the nitty gritty and say, look, another, another situation has happened. It says a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message. Daniel understood this message that had come. He understood that it was going to be long. We don't know what this message was about. 
and he had understanding of the vision. In those days, now it shifts, first person, now Daniel is talking. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. What we do know is he's mourning based on the vision, the special insight that he has. Be careful of the things that you're asking God for because we understand that there's weight to come with the special insight. There's weight to come with the, the gifts that you're asking for. There's weight to come with the blessings you're asking God for. So yes, we know he has these supernatural encounters and he has these encounters with the Lord and he is able to interpret visions, but there is a weight with everything that you're praying for, you're asking for, so much so that it caused him to mourn and to go into fasting. Now listen to this. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks, three full weeks. Three weeks is about how long? 21 days. He's been mourning for 21 days. He's been fasting for 21 days. I ate no pleasant food. Why does he, need, why does he feel the need to tell us this? Because he's in a context where you get to eat at the, the, in the kitchen of the king who has the greatest of all foods. But when he's deciding to fast, remember, he's deciding that I'm going to eat what is necessary and not what is an accessory. I told you that a couple of days ago or yesterday. I'm going to eat what is necessary and not what is an accessory, meaning that I'm going to eat the very basic of basics. I'm not going to eat all the things that I would love to eat or my flesh would love to eat. He says, no pleasant food, no meat, no wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks had been completed. Interesting. Three whole weeks he had been fasting. We'll come to that. It's something that I want, I want to share with you with that. And it says, verse 4, Now on the 24th day of the first month, you're going to miss this, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side on the great river, the, that is, the Tigris River, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with gold of you fast, and it says, uh, his body was like barrel, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like torches of fire. Ever, is this descriptive, you all? Okay, I just want to make sure you all can see the same descriptive nature that I see. And he says, and his arms and his feet uh, burnished bronze in color and, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone, everybody say alone. It says, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see what I saw. Mm -hmm. Somebody go miss this one, because this is what you need to hear. This is what you need to receive. I was alone, and the guys who were with me, they didn't see what I saw. And it says, but a great terror fell upon them. They were afraid. And it says, they ran, and they hid themselves. Therefore, I was left all alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me for my vigor was turned into frailty and I retained no strength. Everybody say weak. weak. So he was weak. All these things are important. I have to read this because I have some principles that I want to give you that I don't want you to miss. And so it says that in verse 9, um, Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, with, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands, and he said to me, Oh, Daniel, this is the good part. All of it's good, actually. Man, greatly beloved, understand the words I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling, and then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. From the first day, the very moment 
You opened your mouth. You set your heart to understand. You decided to humble yourself before God. He says, your words were heard. Someone needs to hear this because you're in a season of delay. Your delay has been longer than any and everyone else. This is not a part of my notes, but someone needs to hear this out there. You've been in a season of delay, but listen to him. He says, from the very first moment that you set your heart to understand and you humbled yourself and you began to seek God's face, your words were heard. So let's hear the other part of what he's what he has, what this angel, this archangel has to say. He says, and I have come because of your prayers. What happens if you stop praying? What happens if you give up too soon? What happens if you let the enemy coax you into saying nobody hears you? The Lord doesn't hear you, so I will not keep fasting. I won't get back up because I've messed up. I won't keep praying. He says, I'm coming because you prayed. I'm coming because you continued to, to set your face to the Lord. I'm coming now because I got something I want to share with you. And he says in verse 13, but now get this. Now, we're not going to have these types of conversations in the church often, but you need to get this right now. He says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Just so you know, he's not talking about a physical prince in Persia. Why would the angel be talking about a natural being opposing him? He is now talking about the spirit realm and he's talking about the spirit prince. And if he, if he dares say the word prince, this means that there is a, a hierarchy. And so he's letting Daniel know whatever the vision was, whatever you've been praying from the very first moment you opened your mouth, God heard you and he sent me to give you the answer. But I want you to know. There has been a spirit prince assigned over this territory that wanted to keep me from getting you the answer. If you don't believe me, let's keep, let's keep reading. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael, chief princes, chief, chief, he's letting you know that there's a hierarchy even in the spirit realm when it comes to the angels. He's saying, now, Michael, who is the archangel, one of the chief princes, listen, he says, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the king of Persia, not the prince, but the king. So whatever you've been praying about is so weighty. How dare you enter into the month of December and say, I'm going to sacrifice one of the most popular, one of the most celebrated months, and I'm going to come in in a different way, and I'm going to talk about some big things. I'm going to usher some big prayers. I'm going to talk to God about some things that's going to shift the atmosphere and shift my life. How dare you not think that the enemy will just send some corporals, some captains, some lieutenants? Now, what you're praying for and what you're praying about requires princes and kings to start moving in the atmosphere. I don't mean to be, I don't mean to, 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 to frighten anyone. I'm trying to, I'm trying to reveal to you what is already in the text. Yeah. Whatever has been revealed to Daniel was so big and so weighty that it sent everybody in the spirit realm, the enemy, into a frenzy. And they are now attacking the angel who's coming to give the answer so much so that it held him up for 21 days. The text says it. I'm, I'm, is that it? Oh. So much so that he got the answer, but going to give it to you, I engaged in some warfare. Why do you think Ephesians 6 says you do not wage war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness that you can't see rulers. And so what's happening right now, he's explaining to him, hey, you've been mourning for long. You've been in delay for a season, but please know God heard you. And I'm glad you didn't stop 
praying and fasting and seeking his face because you didn't get the answer immediately when you asked for it. Yes. It could be that I was in some type of traffic and I was held up. And because you kept praying, reinforcements came. I'm, 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 I'm reading to you the text. And so it says, and, 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 and what, we, what, what verse are we in? All right, that's verse 13. It said, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. And when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. He and suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. So you mean to tell me there's more than one presence there with Daniel? How dare he said there's one, but then all of a sudden one looks like the son of man touched my lips. When the Lord touched my lips, all of a sudden, he says, he says, my Lord, because of the vision, the sorrows that have overwhelmed me and I've retained, I have no, I have not retained any strength. But how can this servant, my Lord, talk with you, my Lord? For as for me, no strength remains in me now, nor in any breath. There's any breath left in me. Get to verse 18 so I can get you the points that you need. Then again, the one having the likeness of a son of man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be to you. Be strong, yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Lord, let, Lord, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? The Lord's talking to him. Now I must return to fight the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. It, it, there is warfare going on. But then he says, but I will tell you what is noted in the scriptures of truth. No one upholds me. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your, your prince. Do you see the possessive noun? Your prince. You look at the text, it says your prince. You have angels assigned to you. And until you recognize that, you will be driving your Ferrari in first gear. Stick shift, six gears. You don't really know how to drive it, so you just drive it in first gear and just burn out the clutch. A different illustration? Okay, try to do a different one next time. There are so many things going on in the spirit realm, and yet... Now this angel, now the presence of the Lord begins to give him more insight into things that he can't see. There, there, there are more angels on our side than there are fallen angels. Revelations will teach you that. Yeah. All right, so Daniel, when we look at this text, now let me give you all what you need. In this text, Daniel is literally being birthed into a new spiritual level. When you look at this text, he's literally, it's, it's literally, he's literally going through a new spiritual birth. He's being birthed to another level spiritually. But if we trace Daniel throughout chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter six, or not chapter three, chapter six, chapter nine, we see the different encounters that he has. But it's so easy for us to read past those and not even acknowledge what's happening in the spirit realm. And yet we're still asking God to give us something and to bless us with something. And there's revelation we're not even recognizing. Everything that is happening in the text, whenever an angel shows up, whenever an angel shows up and then says, I will give you the ability to understand this vision, that's, and that's being increased from one level to another to be able to understand something you did not understand beforehand. And we have to acknowledge the increase. Amen? And so he's in, in this text, he's literally being birth into a, another level spiritually. He couldn't speak. He couldn't stand. It takes the Lord to have to touch him. And then he gains all his strength again. And then the Lord begins to give him everything that he needs for the journey that he's about to go into. Daniel is literally in two places at one time. Think about it. 
I don't take for granted that you can that you even re recognize this. He's in two places in one time. He's right here in earth with his homies, and he's in the presence of God. This is supernatural to be able to be in two places at one time. He's in the presence of God. We see what is descriptive about what's going on, but he's also in his friends, they can't even see what's going on. They can't, they don't even, they hear, they can feel, but they don't have any insight into what's going on. He's caught up in two places, two places at one time. We are given a blueprint into secrets of the supernatural. Daniel gives us secrets of the supernatural. How? Glad you asked. All these things that we're reading, he's showing us. He's showing us. There's secret, there's secrets in the supernatural. The secrets, the secrets, the secrets. But how are we able to gain insight into these secrets? Because Daniel kept a journal. Did y'all, I, I want you to, I didn't get any response here. The reason we're able to gain insight into the supernatural is because Daniel was faithful in keeping a journal. All right, y'all don't believe me. Let me argue my case. When we look at the text, it says, now on the 24th day of the first month, I'm going to give you the date. I'm going to give you the month. I'm going to give you the location. I'm going to give you every particle of clothing this angel had. I'm going to let you know every experience I had. My face went down to the ground. My hands, my palms touched the ground. And then the angel said these specific things to me. I, I, each, each and every moment, movement that happened, Daniel was able to articulate to us. How do you think? Because he has just this crazy memory and he can just tell us everything that happened and all of these other things he has to do too? No, mm -mm. let's not fool ourselves. The reason we're able to gain insight into the supernatural and we can say, okay, these are some things we can do is because Daniel decided that I'm not going to rely on my memory. I'm going to write down the things that occurred on this specific day. But if I never have a pen and I never have some paper, what I'm saying to the Lord, I don't ever expect for you to give me revelation. If I don't walk with something to write with and something to walk on, I'm saying I'm not walking in expectation. But his ability to give us specificity to what happened with him is the reason why we don't have to be stuck because he's helping us right now. Because otherwise, if he had just said, oh, yeah, you know, the Lord showed up and, you know, it was, it was a crazy experience. I was tired and, and my, my friends, they didn't, they weren't there. And I can't quite remember what day it was. Um, I know you all don't believe me. It sounds real crazy, but, you know, I, it happened. No, he was very specific. And it teaches us the benefit and the beauty behind being able and willing to, to write down the vision to make it plain so other people can pick it up and carry it and run with it. We can run with the word of God because someone wrote it down. Yeah. He wrote down his experience, not for me, but for someone else. And so I appreciate that. And so we appreciate him writing what he wrote down and him able to capture what he captured. But this is what I want to help you all with before I allow you all to leave, before we uh, pray, is this. All right, number one. So things about fasting, some things we learn about uh, being in the spirit, some things we learn even about the supernatural is this. Count the days. Don't Plan them. Ooh. Count the days. Don't plan them. When I first started fasting this past summer, when I entered into what the extended period, 
I was at a place of desperation. I know you don't know the feeling of trying to do something on your own and trying to fix something and trying to make something mm -hmm. work to the point you just get tired of your own self. Yes. You done tried everything. You done prayed, but yet you still find yourself holding on, trying to fix and manipulate and work something. And you're like, I thought I was doing it right, but you're not doing it right. And you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, and they usually say, for people who are drug addicts that you really can't help them until they hit rock bottom. And usually you don't know rock bottom until you hit rock bottom. You don't get to say, yeah, I'm at rock bottom. No, you don't, it don't work like that. You, you know when you're there. But I don't make light of that. What I do mean is that you arrive at a point where you just say, you know what? I can't do it any other way anymore. I didn't try praying, I didn't try whistling, I didn't try everything, nothing is working. So I entered into this fast. Nobody you know, kind of told me this, and the Lord gave me revelation insight from mentors and certain people. My attitude was this with the Lord. Lord, I didn't try everything else. I'm going to fast, but I'm going to fast until something breaks. I said, so I know I'm foolish to try to go up against you. Uh, I know it doesn't sound right, but one of us going to give. And Lord, I'm going to keep fasting and I'm going to keep seeking your face until you get tired of me and you just help me to break whatever this needs to be broken and help me in this season of indecision. And I need you to help. So Lord, if that's going to be three weeks, if it's going to be all year, if it's going to be in perpetuity, then I'm just going to do it. And so you enter into 30 days and you're like, well, Lord, I'm going to keep doing it. You enter the 60 days, you thought it was over with. Then you get sick and you're like, ah, you know. But then the Lord said, no, you, you still got some work to do. And you enter until you keep going. More than how long I fasted has nothing to do with you. More to do with the attitude of Let's not make this a transaction. We'll talk about the transactional part tomorrow, right? I'm not going to make this a transaction, Lord. I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to seek you until the very thing that has kept me in bondage absolutely breaks, not just cracks. I want it to break. I want it out of my sight. I want to move forward. I don't want to be in any bondage. So that means I'm going to keep on fasting. Why am I telling you this? Daniel... Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Daniel, in chapter 1, fasted how long? I taught you all. Please don't know. I think. How long did he fast? Ten days. Daniel fasted ten days. The very first time he fasted was for ten days. Vegetables and water only. That ten-day fast impacted the entire nation. So now 20,000 more people who were in bondage now are on the same fast for three years. So they fasted for three years. Three, four, so now 10 days, 1,095 days, and then when you get to chapter 9, he fasted for three days. So you have 10 days, three years, three days, and then when we get to chapter, chapter 10, he fasts for 21 days. Here is our mistake. We will hear somebody, teach or preach and say, we need to do the Daniel fast for 21 days. And we just blindly say, okay, and that's cool because we want to trust people. And we go into a fast for 21 days. And we do a Daniel fast for 21 days because we want the supernatural experience that Daniel had because he fasted for 21 days according to Daniel chapter 10. But we overlook Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 6 or Daniel chapter 9 and understanding Daniel has sweat equity. Yeah. You're trying to fast for 21 days. Daniel fasted for three years before his 21 days ever came about. Yeah. Nehemiah, we'll see that in a couple of weeks or next week. He fasted for four months. You have Moses, Exodus chapter 34, 28. He fasted for 40 days. He was up on the mountain with the Lord, him and the Lord alone. He didn't eat, nor did he have, nor did he have water. 
40 days, he fasted with the Lord. And the Bible says, and he got the revelation and started writing the Ten Commandments. What would have happened if Daniel, if, if Moses had said, instead of 40 days, I'm just going to fast for 10 days? What would have happened to the revelation, the piecemeal, or the half revelation he would have received? If we keep looking, you'll find that Jesus, you know, Jesus went to the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days. The Israelites, Exodus chapter 16, they fasted for 40 years. The intermittent fasting, the quail, and that manna, 40 years. Ezra chapter 8, verse 5, they fasted. We'll see that tomorrow for three days. You have the people that the Ninevites, they fasted for an undisclosed period of time, Jonah chapter 3. Why am I sharing all this with you? Because when you begin to study the people who have fasted and who made fasting a lifestyle, Jesus, nowhere in scripture, entered into the wilderness and said or articulated in any shape, form, or fashion that he was only going to be there for 40 days. He did not enter into the wilderness and say, I'm going to go into the wilderness and be tempted for 40 days. I'll be back in 40 days. He went into the wilderness, allowing the spirit of God to lead him in the wilderness. And he stayed in the wilderness until everything that needed to happen, happened. What would have happened if Moses went on top of the mountain and said, Lord, I know you called me up here to the top of the mountain and you want me to fast because when I fast, I'll be able to hear you far clearer than I would otherwise. But I know you want me to come up there, but how about I come up there for two weeks? Uh, I don't want to be up there that much longer. What would have happened if he had have planned his days instead of counting his days? What we do often is that we enter into our fast already with our schedules set. And we've already made an agreement a silent agreement with our flesh. And so our flesh says to us, okay, cool, three weeks, I tell you what, I'll just hang low for about three weeks. And so three weeks, one minute, into the 22nd day, we'll go ahead and go in. I can hang low if you give me the scheduled time. And so what the text teaches us and the various people teach us, but Daniel specifically teaches us, no, the best thing you can do is don't plan your day. Don't plan your fast. Count it. The 21st day or the 24th day of the first month, this is what happened. This is what, I, this is what happened on this day because I was prepared for it to happen. And as it happened, I articulate exactly what happened because I'm submitting myself to the Lord. I'm not putting God on a time schedule. And so I appreciate that Daniel can show us, can show us this because when you don't have an end date that you are articulating, your flesh can't run the show. Yeah. Your flesh is blind when you have the attitude, I'm going to fast until the Lord says otherwise. Yeah. Now, your flesh is telling you, you stupid. You don't want to do that. I mean, are you, how, you don't want, I mean, come on. Think about it. You don't want to do that. But it's more about the Lord and less about you. And it teaches us then to now be much more sensitive to what God is saying to us. So that we can move out of legalism and start actually following the Holy Spirit of God. Because yeah. if I say I'm going to do three weeks and I don't do three weeks, then the Lord is going to send me to hell. You'd be surprised at the conversations the flesh will whisper in our ears. So, so what am I saying? I'm saying that one thing about fasting and one thing even about walking in the spirit is that we have to learn to count the days and don't plan them. It's power in counting and paying attention to what happens in the days instead of saying, Lord, I'm going to give you six days, seven days to do what you need to do. And if you don't do it, then I'm going to question if you are who you say you are. Because the image of who I have in my mind about you is unreasonable, but I won't tell myself that. 
So I'm going to fast. And if, and if I fast, because the Bible says I should fast, but if I fast in three days and you don't heal me what I need you to heal me of, then I don't know if you are who you say you are. That's pretty unfair. Yeah. But that's what we do. So you count the days and you don't, you don't plan them. The second thing is this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. God manifests himself in our weakness. God does his greatest work when we allow ourselves to be weak. The text says, therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision. No strength remained in me. I couldn't stand. My head is bowed. The truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is, Daniel <laughs> was his absolute weakest when he has this encounter with God. Don't miss it. It's something for us to take with us. He's his absolute weakest when he experiences the manifestation of our Lord. Why is that important? Anybody here tired today? Yeah. I know I was tired before I came in here. I was like, when is this going to yeah. be over? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I can't be honest with you all? Yeah. I think y'all appreciate because I'm yeah. honest. Yeah. We don't want to be weak because we lose control. Mm. We're not in control. Yeah. It makes sense in our rational mind to always be in control, but if I'm weak, I am not in control. When I am not in control, God is his most powerful. Yeah. God makes his manifestation, and he's so much more fluid when we are not our strongest. I'm strong, and the Lord is strong. Let's see how that works. It's just going to be a boxing match. We're just playing tug of war. But when you're weak, you can't fight back, and you're in absolute surrender, voluntarily, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to voluntarily deprive myself of the nutrition that I need right now because I need to just be in God's presence. But I'm so weak. This doesn't make sense. Why am I so weak? I, just, I, need, to, I need to eat. No, that is exactly what I'm mourning. Daniel says, I'm mourning. I haven't eaten anything really substantial for three weeks and I'm just tired. And when I'm at my weakest, then God shows up. Can you handle being weak? Sounds like a simple question, but it has layers to it. Can you handle truly being weak? Like, like can you really handle being weak? Almost all of us, it's very hard. Because the way you've been made up, the way you operate, how you've led your family, how you dug yourself out of the ditch, how you pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, you get where you have gotten because you've been strong. But there's certain levels of the spirit, and I'm talking to my own self, that you will not be able to advance to until you learn how to be weak. I'm not just saying, saying the word weak. I'm talking about literally operating in weakness. I, I can't. I surrender. And so it's so beautiful that when we see this text that Daniel, I have, I have, I have nothing to give. I'm weak. Just, just think about Moses. 40 days, no food, no water. All you have is the presence of the Lord and you are okay? Absolutely. He survived on God's presence. Yeah. I'm not advocating that you go out today and do a 40-day fast. Mm -hmm. Let that be clear. What I am saying is when you are your weakest, you will be able to experience things about God that you would not have been able to experience in your strength. I promise you that. And when you get tired of boxing and you get tired of doing things your way and you get tired of making it be the way you want it to be and you choose to surrender, you'll start to see miracles happen. You'll start to see shackles broken. Some of the greatest advancements in my relationship with my mother happened when I decided to let go. 
When I decided that, you know what, I can't make this thing work the way Isaac has in his own narrative. Mm -mm. When I decided to do the hardest thing ever, which is to say, you know what, I actually don't have the answers and I actually can't do this. I surrender to God. You got it. I'm upset, whatever. Then the Lord moves. We can be our own hold up. But, but don't, don't miss it. Don't miss it. God manifests himself in our weakness. And let me give this to you. I know time is ticking, but I got to give it to you. I want to give it to you. The presence of God is greater than the company of people. Yes. Yeah, I know y'all say amen, but I want to know are you going to practice it, though. The presence of God yes. is greater than the company of people. Somebody go ahead and, 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 and type that. The presence of God is greater than the company of people. And I know it's one of those flashy statements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but do we really apply it, though? Do we really practice it the way we really need to? What are you saying? It says, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me didn't see a thing. I told you a couple of days ago that, you know, that promotion is pressurized. And as you get higher and higher, the air gets thinner and thinner and everybody can't breathe thin air. And so there's some places that God is elevating you to that the people who are around you just won't be able to handle. Yeah. And so the text says that but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled and they hid. And it says, therefore, as a result, I was left alone. What do you say? Catch this. In Daniel chapter one, when you find Daniel, you find him with who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew boys. They rolled as an item. You see Daniel, you see them. As a matter of fact, when you look at Daniel chapter 2, when he received the promotion, the Bible says that he went back to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and argued and rallied on the three Hebrew boys' behalf so that they could receive a promotion too. I want those types of friends. Yeah. <laughs> you getting promoted, you're experiencing elevation, don't forget about me. It says it in Daniel chapter 2. So in Daniel chapter 1 and 2, you see Daniel and you see the three Hebrew boys. Partnership. Hmm. You get to Daniel chapter 6. The lion's den. We don't see Daniel. We don't see, we don't see the three Hebrew boys anymore. Yeah. I, maybe you did. I didn't. <laughs> you look at Daniel chapter 6. He's inside of the lion's den. There are no Hebrew boys. That's fine. We got lives. We can always be around each other. You get to Daniel chapter 9. There's no Hebrew boys. Daniel chapter 6, when he encounters what he encounters, he's by himself. Daniel chapter 9, the that he has, he's by himself. When we started this journey, we started it with the three Hebrew boys, but somewhere through the process, things shift, things change. He's alone, but he's still experiencing elevation and promotion. But in Daniel chapter 10, he has some new friends. They're hanging with him. But when the vision came, they fled. This is what it says. Sometimes we won't be afforded the opportunity to have people to align ourselves with. I'm not advocating one side or the other. As an introvert, yeah, I argue, do everything alone, right? But that's not even the case. As an extrovert, you argue, do everything with somebody. I got to have this experience with you. You got to do it with me. We have to both experience it, or I like experiencing everything all by myself. There has to be a balance. But listen, sometimes we will not be afforded the opportunity to align ourselves. And some seasons, the Lord needs to see that you trust in him more than you trust in company. Amen. Don't miss this. Some seasons, God will have you rolling alone because he needs to know that you trust in him more than you trust in having company. Many of us, we have to have company.
We usually arrive in chapter 10 and say we want a chapter 10 experience. Most of us, many of us, we read this and we say, Lord, why haven't you showed up in my life? That chapter, I want that chapter 10 glory. I want that chapter 10 experience that Daniel had. He was fasting for three weeks and he had this supernatural encounter. God, you gave him strength and power to see beyond the natural. I want a chapter 10 experience. You can't have a chapter 10 experience without a chapter one obedience. You cannot have a chapter 10 experience. Without a chapter one obedience, you cannot skip the process. What happens? We want to jump to chapter 10, but we overlook the chapter one. It's on your job. Just go against the grain. There's things that you want to happen that can and will happen in your life, but you will mismanage the glory. Because you haven't even mastered the obedience. I'm simply saying, it's chapter 10. Apply to our own lives. So, in short, you can plan for the fasting process, but you can't plan the fasting process. I'm giving you takeaways. I'm giving you the four takeaways. You can plan for the fasting process, but you cannot plan the fasting process. Everybody get me? It sounds like a tongue twist. It sounds like that makes sense, but it makes all the sense in the world. You can plan for the fasting process, but you can't plan the fasting process. If you've been praying and you've been fasting and something still hasn't broken, it's probably because you put a lid. His points. Yeah. Denying the flesh regularly will make you weak, and God meets us in our weakest points. The third takeaway desire to be in the presence of God more than you desire to be in the presence of company. Desire to be in the presence of God more than you desire to be in the presence of company. There's some seasons where God needs to know that you trust him more than you trust everybody else. Number four, and the last point is, this is all not new stuff. This is just, you know, a review. I know y'all not writing it fast because they're telling me to slow down, so I'm going to slow down. Number three takeaway is desire to be in the presence of God more than you desire to be in the presence of company. It's safer to be with folk. It's safer for us to have the same struggle and the same complaint than it is for us to sit in God's presence and for him to reveal us, reveal to us everything about us and we actually have to do something about it. And we can't run to anybody. We can't run to mama, we can't run to friend, we can't run to cousin. We just got to run to the Lord. Sounds easy, one of the hardest things to do. And for those of us like myself who can be more of an introvert, then you got to learn how to step out and start asking people for help. You got to start leaning on other people for things that you much prefer to do on your own. God has to build all the muscles. Number four is you can't have a chapter 10 experience without a chapter one 
obedience. The broadcast pause. What's number one and two? Um, you can plan for the fasting process, but you can't plan the fasting process. That's number one. And number two, denying the flesh regularly will make you weak. God meets us, meets us at our weakest moments. You can plan for the fasting process, but you can't plan the fasting process. Number one, and denying the flesh regularly will make you weak. God meets us in our weakest moments. That's one and two. Listen, Facebook, I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. I have to get ready to log off because I want to dismiss um, our family here. And I want to be able to pray for those of us who want to remain behind and pray. Um, everyone, listen, do that. Deneen, you all put the numbers up there. Bless everybody. Let people know. I'll see you all at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Pray for my strength um, as I pray for your strength. So, again, I'll see you all. May the Lord be with you. May God's spirit guide you, guard you, and speak to you in a way that you will hear, understand, and obey. May the Lord give you the answers to your prayers. And may the Lord build your faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray I bless you all. You all have a wonderful day.